when you kind of have some of those jobs, you you get, unfortunately, especially as a small business, you kind of just get into this habit of like, wow, I'm just going to come in and I'm going to press a button all day. And there's not a lot of creativity or engagement going on. By eliminating some of that, we've been able to free our staff up to, to think more creatively, to be more involved. And I, I think that then has, has led to a lot of those gains in other areas. Hello and welcome. This is the ILT Business Podcast, episode four, a new guest, recorded January 25th, 2020. Well, we're still in New Jersey. Uh, last you heard from us, we were in, uh, I was with Josh in his house, new house in New York City. And uh, this week, Josh is still on vacation, so no Josh today. Instead, we have a, uh, a guest, a client, where he prefers his privacy, so we're going to use a pseudonym for him. He's already laughing. We, we were making a lot of jokes on, like, what kind of names he should use, and we came up with some, maybe some off-color names. So uh, why don't you introduce yourself to the crowd? How's everybody going? I'm uh, Simon. <laughs> <laughs> So he's going to call himself Simon for this uh, for this episode. He'll be uh, a regular guest for a while. We've got a lot to talk to him about. Like I said, he's a real client. Uh, just uh, because of the nature of his situation, we prefer to have his privacy. And uh, what I wanted to do with Simon, I got to remember, not to call you the wrong name, is kind of talk about our journey together as consultant and, and client, right? Do you want to Tell a little bit about how that process started and, and how you came to know us and what that journey kind of looked like. Sure. I mean, I, I think we probably go back with ILC, what, five, six years? Yeah, you were one of the first clients, for sure. Um, and we started off by, you know, we had implemented Fishbowl and we were looking for a way to uh, enhance the product beyond what it was. So we started looking into some of the additional reports and we ultimately came by ILC. And at the time, we really only believed that we might be able to do some additional reporting functionality. You actually, I remember the email, uh, it was the last trip I came out here to see you. I went back to some of the first initial emails that we had, uh, that we had ex exchanged. And what the first purpose of the first trip was to actually upgrade you. You want our very old version of Fishbowl when uh, I started working with you again. And you said, hey, come out for two weeks so that we can get all this upgraded because we didn't want to be, you didn't want to have challenges. You had even had a, a previous employee write a bunch of reports for you. The implementation just needed some TLC to kind of keep things cleaned up. So the first week I, I met with you, we were just cranking on reports just to get you ready for the upgrade. You remember yeah. that? Yeah, I mean, it was uh, <laughs> so long ago. It's amazing. <laughs> but... When we were doing that, we had had so many issues uh, trying to upgrade ourselves. And I think it was you know, the earlier days of Fishbowl for sure. So, yeah. and I, if I recall correctly, around that time, we were probably one of the largest databases that they had. That's right. So we had some of those size complications and we just felt that we couldn't do the upgrades by ourselves because it wasn't worth the downtime. I remember going through that initial introduction because the way that you and I worked together we really had to close the distance. You actually put me in a, in a the pen, <laughs> <laughs> the pen of employees. Just found like a random desk as it's. Well, sat that's me good. Out there. I thought we put you in the server room. No, no, no. In no, between no. the bathrooms. Now. No, no, no. Okay. That didn't happen. That that was fishbowl jail. Wow. <laughs> you guys called it at your old office, but no, you actually put me out in the middle of the employees, and and I remember distinctly going through the process of like, just familiarizing myself with the business and the reports. And uh, I think people kind of do figure out like what the business, what is important to the business when you realize what modifications they've added to it and what things that they're really, really interested in. And I saw so many reports on managing picks, managing purchase orders. In fact, I saw a lot of duplicate pick, uh, duplicate reports. And for me, it was hard to figure that out. So I remember inching closer to your office and finally just kind of setting up a, set up again office in your office, because I needed to ask you questions. I needed to, to know what you were about. And then I think the second week, I cemented yourself right next to you <laughs> and just continued on. But that was a that was a really, really interesting trip. You were, you were one of my first clients that, I think even my only client, who regularly needed two week trips. Because there was just so much we wanted to do after that first trip. Tell, tell, uh, tell the audience what I, what I told you when I was trying to like get through your head 
the first time of like, why do we have so many reports? Why don't we? Yeah, I mean, if we're talking about it, and I'm certainly not a, an easy person to get close to. So, you know, that's why I sat out on the floor. <laughs> but I think it was when you kind of question, why are we doing these as reports when we had rules, we had the inputs, we had all of the variables understood, and you said, why don't we just turn this into an application? So instead of people having to review reports, the system just handles this. And I kind of just looked at you sideways with the, the that's not really possible, is it, kind of look. And <laughs> you kind of gave me the, I, I kind of think we can do that. And so began our very long relationship of continuing to build out applications that have made my business run much more effectively and efficiently by, frankly, taking the things that we were doing on a daily basis and automating I think one of the first things that we, we started helping with you was the, uh, the purchasing process. We gave you one of the early versions of what we now affectionately call Alfred. Yep. Why do we call it Alfred? Uh, he's Batman's butler. Makes it all happen behind the scenes. <laughs> the best employee. Never never takes a sick day. Sometimes he gets drunk, but that's because... <laughs> he, he, makes some, he's, he makes some mistakes. He's had some mistakes over the versions, but... Uh, what, what are we on? Alfred 3.0, but really, even after today's work, now we're kind of Alfred 4.0. Yeah. You know, we we make those little modifications every single time because we we learn so much. But I mean, with the original Alfred to what it is now, we just changed our entire entire purchasing approach because we originally built it for how we did the business then. As Alfred gave us more and more capabilities we started to realize we could do so much more. And so we've had to modify that program to keep pace with all the things that sort of the, the walls that we knocked down and the things that we can now do. It's been really just a game changer for us. I mean, we went from four or five purchasing people originally when we started with no Alfred down to effectively zero now uh, full time other than just some uh, clerks who do follow up work, but no one who actually is is placing it because, as I said before, like we have rules, we had the inputs, and we were able to say, well, if these are our firm, why not program solutions? Right. And I think the second thing that I remember, you know, in my mind, because at the time I was uh, dabbling in uh, with some uh, projects in Australia, and in Australia they had a, a facility where the head office was in Sydney and one of the warehouses was in Perth. And because Australian internet is a bit poor, the original version of the Windows mobile scan gun software worked really poorly. And I think there was a competitor for WMS solutions, but that competitor ran their software in New York and it didn't work well that far away. So I remember coming to you one year uh, saying, look, I'm interacting with the WMS features of Fishbowl, the, the, the picking features, and I see that you've got a lot of people just clicking in Fishbowl committing things. Remember that? Remember, remember when we when I floated the idea, I was like, why don't we just make an auto commit? Yeah, I mean, auto. <laughs> remember I'm that? Actually, this is all, I'm not sure uh, how I feel about all these memories now coming back to me, but one of the things actually before we even go on to that was just on the, the purchasing. I'm just thinking about it, but sure. was... Man, when we did that first version of Alfred, we actually, we programmed everything in to look at historical data to do forecast purchasing because we, because of the time it took to frankly get POs into the system. Um, I mean, we do, I don't know how some of your other clients are, but we've got 30,000 SKUs that we are going to purchase. We do a, a lot of smaller purchases, and some of these SKUs are you know, $2, $3. We're buying quantities of two or six or something small. But So that entry time was exhausting, and we would take on inventory positions. When we got through all of that programming and the original effort for forecasting, we started to say, well, we can do this so fast now, we could start to move more to just-in-time inventory purchasing. And so the, the big shift was then in the later versions that we have now, it's all built strictly off of demand with us purchasing just in time because we can order from 50 vendors in a matter of two minutes and hit our demand needs exactly. So we've 
we've changed completely how we handle our inventory to the tune of probably reducing our inventory overhead by 50%. That's just been fantastic for our cash flow as a business and we're using that in better areas. So, I mean, I, I kind of forget some of that because it was five, six years ago. And, you know, candidly, I don't want to admit that we used to purchase like that, but right. but we did. Man, yeah, it's just definitely a... Uh, a jog down memory lane. I think about working with uh, with Simon here is that you were really willing to try something out. And I was very honest with you saying like, I've done this maybe once before and your situation or circumstances are, are, are wildly different, but you want to give it a shot. I think, I think, I think there's some lessons there that you could probably give to other business owners about having some kind of confidence in, in maybe not just us. Cause it's not always us. Like there's people are going to be listening and wanting to work with other companies that want to improve things. But there's usually this this hesitation that I feel that business owners go, well, I, 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 it, it's risky for me to try. And what was your process like in you know, trying some of these projects out? Because we've had some dead ends, certainly in the past. Yeah, I mean, we've had some <laughs> that haven't worked out for us. But I think the, the hardest thing as a, a person running a business is inevitably at some point you've had consultants come through and you've probably been burned to a degree they don't really ever take the time to understand your business and you kind of get this mindset that somehow your business is special um, and that they they can't understand it and i think once we sort of let our guard down and um, allowed ilc really to kind of come in the interest you you took in our business and actually understanding what we do not just the the programming aspect of it but you were able to give us that extra input. And I mean, the amount of times where I've wanted to do something and you've stopped me from doing something probably pretty stupid, I, I think is probably a longer list than the things that we've tried that haven't worked out. And I think that's where it's definitely been a mutually beneficial partnership because, yeah, we're willing to try new things with the belief that, you know, it's possible. And uh, I mean, again, you just go back on some of these other elements, whether it be the the auto commit that you were discussing before or the purchasing, we've been able to get so much better that it, I wouldn't say that we've eliminated jobs fully. We've been able to move that staff into more productive areas of growing the business instead of on these sort of, you know, frankly, bullshit jobs. No, of, I agree. Of pressing a button to commit inventory. Yeah. And now that staff is doing things that are productive. So when I, I try and wrap my head around, you know, the, the ROI aspect of doing some of these projects, it's, it's sort of been limitless at this point because we continue to get the benefits of something we made several years ago. And that cost now is, you know, completely insignificant to the, the benefits that we're getting. I think at the time, and that's where, you know, especially when we were first out of the gate, it was like, man, I don't know. We're a small business. I don't know if I can do something like this. Let's get a guy off the street who, you know, we can hire full time to do this and who can get involved. And it just, we went through probably three or four people trying to have, have them and they don't really end up with enough to do some of the days, then they're not really an expert on all of the workings of the system. So they're only doing exactly what you ask them to do. Um, whereas ILC has been able to come in and tell us about features and functions that we didn't know existed in Fishbowl, but more importantly, also give us kind of ideas that have come from other businesses that are working, other businesses that aren't working and help us kind of create our path that way. I think for, for me as, as the, as the consultant here, I take it very seriously to, to kind of take your case and go like, okay, what is, what's really best for Simon's business here? I take that with a, with a, with a huge, uh, huge level of pride because I think I've worked at enough, uh, enough companies where, you know, I, I, I feel like the, the, the people level aspect is, is so much more than necessarily the inner workings of the business. Like, you know, like you said, the bullshit jobs point, right? The, the, the pressures and the, and the, and the stress that comes from, from just having to be completely on point and precision. I think you kind of forget, and I'm reminding myself now that like when somebody forgot to do something, 
the company spent a lot of time figuring that out and troubleshooting. You know, and once we we took those those human elements out of the equation, I think the stress levels that people had uh, were lowered, and therefore they had the energy and time, and you certainly had the energy and time to kind of grow the business and do something even more with it. Do you want to talk a little bit about you know growing the business in that path since the early days? Sure. I mean, well, when we first started, I was the owner of the business, and uh, after several years of uh, successful growth for a variety of reasons. We eventually um, were able to sell the business. And um, now, I think from the time when you first started working with us to now, I would say that our uh, revenues have probably more than doubled and our profits have probably just about tripled. And so I, I think there's been a lot of factors, obviously, some of the programming that we've done has, has been a, a big factor, but I think it's probably more the impact it's had on those in, intangibles of, like I said, getting the, the staff to be more involved in important areas of the business as opposed to utilizing them in these ways. Like you have to do it. You have to commit for our business. You've got to be able to commit the work orders uh, so that that inventory can flow cleanly into the manufacturing stages uh, because we do a lot of small assemblies. And I mean, on a daily basis, we probably do about two to 300 different assemblies. So it, it, it has to happen, but it was a question of, do we really need people to do that? Mm -hmm. And I think when you kind of have some of those jobs, you, you get, unfortunately, especially as a small business, you kind of just get into this habit of like, wow, I'm just gonna come in and I'm gonna press a button all day and there's not a lot of creativity or engagement going on. By eliminating some of that, we've been able to free our staff up to, to think more creatively, to be more involved. And I, I think that then has, has led to a lot of those uh, gains in other areas. In terms of um, advice you might give to either people, because I think most of what we talked about isn't really necessarily the fishbowl platform, even though you, you are using it, you've been using it a very long time. When you implemented fishbowl, what were some of the surprising things you had with getting what you would call your first system implemented because you had come from QuickBooks before. Right. Right. And you had no system. <laughs> Excel was your system well, at I that point. I think we had a system. <laughs> it was very detailed. Yeah, because in the last episode, Josh and I were talking about how like once you're trying to share an Excel workbook, you need a system. I mean, we were Excel. We were for some of our labels and things of that nature that we put on our products. We were Microsoft Word templates that we would have to manually go in and adjust as opposed to being able to take the data from the, the, the work orders direct. It was kind of a nightmare, but it was what we knew. And I think the as it relates to the, the challenge, it falls very heavily into the category if you don't know what you don't know. And so I, I think you struggle sometimes uh, as a business owner or as a person responsible for a company where you you've got the big picture and you've got the staff and you've got the jobs and responsibilities all mapped out and you kind of see that as what it's going to be moving forward i don't think that there's really a mindset that you can bring in these types of solutions and actually fundamentally change the way the company does business and i think everybody thinks that a new system will help them improve their their business it'll make them more efficient maybe save some money but ultimately they see it as like and maybe even like eliminate a job here or there but i don't think that they see it as fundamentally changing the way that they do business for us the changes that we've made it, it's done that it has changed our business approach completely. It's allowed us to do bigger projects. It's allowed us to do things that previously we would have shied away from because we would have just said, hey, that's that's for somebody who's frankly a larger company than us. And so I think that's probably the hardest part, though, is really trying to get your head around what is possible when you don't actually know what's possible yet. Right. I, uh, I think that's the, because one of the things that I think I, I try to explain to my customers or some new customers that I've going to start working with is like I act as a pollinator. You know, I to, I I take ideas from different companies and I spread them around. And that's that's honestly why we're doing the podcast now is because the company historically ILC, you know, we had a a, a media presence in like 2017, 2018 that really kind of stopped in 2019. We just got really busy. And I've heard a lot of people come and tell me it's like I wish I knew 
you guys, and I wish I knew you guys were doing these cool things with other companies, because uh, I've been you know, waiting for a message like you or, or an idea that, that you have. And um, I'm glad that you know, we're able to share that now. It's very clear that when it comes to technology, I think a lot of business owners need to respect the fact that it's going to take time to build out the technology, but that technology is now yours, right? That capability becomes yours. And, and, and not only that, but the, the change of culture and the change of ideas starts becoming a little intoxicating. I, I call, um, uh, so, so with the company does a little bit uh, for the audience, a little bit of dashboard work. And we, you and I had just done some dashboard work as well, as well on this trip. And I kind of like that to executive crack. <laughs> it's just a drug. You know, once you realize that, oh, wow, I can easily get this information in front of me, I don't have to work towards it. It gives me a leading or a lagging indicator of what's happening in the business. I can manage that more. I feel like software, uh, dashboards, tools, uh, systems, and things like that are the components where some of that, that final magic, that dashboard magic, because the thing, because I think people sometimes will, are looking at a problem and they go, I need a dashboard for that. But they have no system to connect that with. You know, Have a system, have a platform, and, and, and kind of show you the ways. I think a, a big thing um, a lot of companies don't do is they, they don't get comfortable with the idea that, that it's possible and that they don't try to even research that. Do you, do you believe that? Did you? Oh, absolutely. I mean, I think what I was saying before, too, is just that, you know, I think everybody who runs a business at some point or another has had consultants come through who they just haven't had a, a great experience with. So, you know, it just, frankly, at the very beginning, our guard's going to be up against yeah, any nonsense. And I think um, kind of what you were saying, though, about w with ILC, what we at least found was that we had the ability then to manage our own tools afterwards, yeah. whereas so many of the other folks who have been through our doors, they wanted to create a solution that really only they knew how it worked. And mm -hmm. it, it was sort of like if I needed I to, know who you're to, talking to about. do a <laughs> small little thing, it was like, I got to make a phone call. I've got to ask this person to now take care of this and make this tiny little tweak and I'm going to get billed at whatever. And it, and it was just nonsense. And so from there, that sort of, that, that trust there of you're building the solution so that you're honestly not needed in the future, I think is really counter, frankly, to what most experiences with consultants are, which is consultants, you know, you tend to think that they're going to come in and they're going to try and create a solution that's good enough, but one where you'll need to keep calling them back. We keep calling you back, not because we're trying to keep doing the same things, but because we keep saying, oh, okay, it's like a drug, we can do more, we can do more. And, um, I think that's been the difference, and I, I kind of just wish other, frankly, other consultants that were out there understood that the best way to actually grow your relationship with a client is not to keep secrets and keep all these things that you're so specialized and only you can do, but actually give the, your, your clients the tools to do it themselves so that they can keep creating new ideas and new projects. I think at one point we even built a, a tool with you guys that allowed you to write your own kind of reports. At least, because you have a lot yeah, of... Yeah, we called it IsBot. IsBot. Because I think it's hilarious. <laughs> and I know it drives you nuts, but... <laughs> I know. Uh, it, it's just part of... It's just it's, It literally became part of the culture here, you know, to, uh, to say... We use IsBot every single day. Every yeah. single person can... And I, I crack up every single time in a meeting. Someone's like, oh, well, it's in IsBot um, <laughs> because of the name. But, um, you know, I, I think the, it's a self-service tool for our regular everyday staff who are not going to be technically savvy, nor should we ever expect them to be, are able to pull live data, queries. With heavy it, amounts of data. He heavy. I mean, stuff that previously, when we were running it directly in the system, would crash the system. And now, and it's sort of just like, it's very intuitive in that it just walks them through. I want this. I want this. I want this. Hit the refresh button. Data comes out in the format. So, I mean, those are... The, the little tools that, you know, and it's crazy, I call them little tools, we use them every day, but they haven't been game-changing applications in terms of, like, what they actually do. I mean, it just gets data. Right. But the the time wasted previously on just it was, getting it was just, data just waiting was, around. was yeah. massive. I mean, it's, it's like this dashboard situation. I, I think 
when you say you know dashboards are kind of like executive crack, uh, what you've got to understand is, as executives, I want to briefly, uh, briefly, I'm talking like five minutes, two minutes, n- nothing. I just want to check the stats, what's going on, because I've got to be responsible for the, the big picture. And I want to make sure in all of the areas of the business we're doing what we need to do. But when you go to those respective department managers or process managers and you say, hey, how many picks do we have here? Or, you know, what kind of value are we shipping there? And they kind of look at you and they give you this look of like, all right, I can get that for you. It's going to take me 10 minutes, 15 minutes. And then you realize that you're asking all these people in your company to give up 10 or 15 minutes a piece so that you can do a quick two minute glance. And honestly, you kind of want it every day. So now you're asking four or five people in our company to pull these metrics for you once a day at, you know, even if it's 10 minutes a day, how many hours are you losing of productivity each week? Because, and like, I feel bad as a, right. a boss who, who like kind of knows that it's going to take them longer <laughs> to do it than I'm going to actually look at it. But at the same time, it's necessary. So I think these dashboards, though, they become a great way because, frankly, I don't get that look from the the employees anymore of like, oh, all right, I'm kind of in the middle of something, but like, I know that you need it and they have to gauge where do they squeeze this in their day and I can check it when I I want to. And there's all the stats, everything I need, and everybody else can kind of go about their day and I'm getting all those hours back. So it's executive crack, as you say, for a reason because it's also – now on my time, when I right. feel like, hey, I need to, to look at these stats, I can do that. Whereas otherwise, I kind of, I'm that boss is like, hey, do you have that information for me yet? You know, and I've got to keep following up with people. But realistically, they're also busy. And then next thing you know, they get it to me. And then I let it sit on my desk for a day, you know, a, a day because <laughs> now I'm busy. Now you're so busy. the sort of live, constantly updating dashboard with all these metrics in it, I pop in, I, I check it out in the morning, I check it out you know, around my lunch break, and if I see something jump off the screen, then I can go uh, discuss it with that respective department, but I'm not, frankly, wasting their time during the day. Yeah, I've noticed that. I've, I've noticed that with other companies, because I, I, not all the companies I work with have dashboards or are ready for a dashboard, but there's been some studies where that is that kind of executive, I hate to call it interruption, but let's call it what it is, it's an interruption. Because their job is to run the operations most of the time. They're not there to be glorified computers. Remember, back in the day, computers was an actual person calculating numbers for a a foundry or NASA or whatever, uh, Hidden Figures, that movie. Um, And uh, nowadays, the, the, the work is a lot more relational, a lot more managing a transaction. But the calculation of the metrics really shouldn't have been a person's job. But I think a lot of what happens is that um, the need for that information exceeds the ability for the company to respond to that. And maybe someone like me isn't available to build that solution, so you end up throwing people at it. So depending on like what the timing of those sort of things, and this is not, doesn't apply to you necessarily, but because there isn't like a forethought, it's like, yes, you should probably have a way to look at your cost of goods more than once a year, right? That's why we have QuickBooks. That's why we have systems that gives you a cost of goods report that should be easy to run. But then putting collating that into one place where it's easier for an executive to see, most of the time it's at that, that level that most companies go to. Or by the time they say, okay, now I need cost of goods sold divided by product line. And it seems like a simple request, but then it goes, you know what? Honestly, what is a product line? We've never tracked that. And all, all of our historical data doesn't have product line. Right. Well, you know I, mean? I, I think, you know, to that point, too, it's sort of like some of this work that we've done, it hasn't, it, it answers questions that we have, but honestly, it just leads to more availability to ask more, more questions, deeper questions. Exactly. and deeper <laughs> questions. And so we keep going. It, it's just, you know, previously I'd be able to get the top line information because it's like, hey, I don't want you to spend more than, you know, 20, 30 minutes on this. And you, you know, you've got to value your, your staff's time, but at the same time, you need the information. But now that it's just sort of rolling, you go, okay, well, what else could we do with this time? And wow, that's I'm getting it more frequently, as you said, once a year down to daily, um, right down to, hey, 
this spike to a different level than what your you know, typical rate is, pay attention. Something happened. Go, go address it now as opposed to you get to the end of the year and you're like, so what the heck happened in March? <laughs> right. You know, and, and it just, it's allowing us to then ask those deeper questions, see something that went wrong in the process almost instantly, and then take corrective action. So the, again, I, I think for me, even previously, and I hate admitting these types of things, but as someone who was running the company with the tools that I had five, six years ago, I probably wasted a tremendous amount of people's time on just nonsense because I, I, I needed it. It yeah, wasn't yeah. nonsense to me. But ultimately, it kind of, you know, it's a relative busy job. And now through some of these changes, I think I've just gotten to the point where I, I really see the value in the staff's time doing other things other than trying to simply get this data and collect basic information that should readily be available right i guess what's the what's the future for for your systems at your company what are some of the things you'd like to try to get done this year <laughs> that's a good question i mean i think you know with us it's more of a one thing leads to another right now with uh, our company we're moving into a larger warehouse space and so i think the the challenges that we're going to have where We've got a larger facility that's no longer connected directly to our facility. There's going to be uh, challenges, but honestly, not to be cliche, those challenges really are opportunities for us because we're going to be in a position where we're going to have to be better with our technical solutions as opposed to being able to manually override some of these issues that we've encountered in the past. So as we we see what's going on there. Um, right now, our focus is really on planning. And that's where with the dashboard, we've, this past week, we've built out solutions that give us insights into the workload that's coming up, looking at historical data for uh, how we're trending uh, to get an idea of the, the labor force that we're gonna need for the weeks, months uh, ahead. Um, we're also taking a lot of the scheduling work that we've kind of done over the years in terms of the work order picks and we the, talked about that. we've talked about the PO scheduling and how that then rolls over to the work orders and allows that us to... That could also be in its own, and its own all, show. Yeah, and it's all automated. And it's like, but we're taking that data now and beyond just keeping it sort of internally, we're making it so that we can um, really use it for bigger planning purposes than we ever had before. And I think that's where I can just go back to it's... It's not that it's answering all the questions, it's answering questions, but it's giving us new questions and better questions that keep allowing us to, to be better. And hopefully the, the offshoot of all this sort of extra work and sort of new challenge slash opportunity is that we actually can service our customers better. We can get orders out the door quicker because we're identifying problems quicker. And in our industry, we have a lot of problems with uh, the product coming in. And, but we're also fortunate we can also make adjustments to that product. Right. This is going to give us so much more uh, advanced notice to address that, but it's also going to let us match our, our workload up with our labor force and make sure that we kind of really have a strong balance there. So uh, I think this year is really just all about the, the move and the planning resources. Awesome. Well, I think that's it for today. Let's do some uh, cleanup and housekeeping. Uh, Simon will be back on the show probably a few more times this year. We'll be talking about some other systems we've built in the past, some of the challenges he's faced in uh, navigating the process of selling a company. And uh, maybe we'll talk about you know the trends that our small business is dealing with and uh, navigating because uh, you know today we're just getting the news of China you know, you are very uh, dependent on some of the products from China. They have got the Wuhan, you know, uh, virus out there. Who knows what that's going to affect? And come back so that we can talk some more on business changes, uh, challenges, employees, staff, you know, everything that's that's kind of up for debate. And don't forget, I want to flip the script on you one of these episodes too, where I ask you some questions about you know, what you've encountered as a consultant going into companies. You know, I'd like, I'm, I'm interested in where we kind of measure up. and We'll have one of those those sessions where I'm I'm the patient and you're the therapist. That, that's the cost of, of me doing this is I want, I want all the dirt on uh, what you experience too. Well, if you want to ask Simon, 
some questions or myself, go ahead and send us an email at podcast at ilx.io. That's uh, P-O-D-C-A-S-T at ilx.io. Thank you for listening. Uh, take a take a break sometime. It's a, it's a weekend. It's a Saturday if you're listening on this. But otherwise, get back to work. We'll talk to you soon. Cheers. <laughs>